morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Where we're going to pick up in our Gospel Clarity series. I'm not sure what's going on there. Yep. Uh, Romans 8. And uh, let, me, let me begin by praying. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we love you. And um, every time I step up in front of your sacred desk, Lord, I uh, feel a weight of responsibility uh, that, if I allow myself to think about it, is a little too overwhelming. So, Lord, I pray that you would help me to say only what you um, would have me to say. I pray that you would be at work very actively between individuals and your spirit, that um, the bulk of the communication that happens here this morning in this room would happen between individuals and the spirit that lives in them, not between me and them. Lord Jesus, would you convict and change and move in ways that um, I have not even thought of or couldn't even um, fathom or imagine if I tried to. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would do good things today in our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, you know, you guys know Pastor Colby, uh, you know, leads our teaching. That's one of his roles on our eldership, and he does a great job with that. And, um, and uh, he um, assigned me this week, <coughs> uh, you know, it's Mother's Day, so you want to encourage the mothers. Uh, and your text is Romans 8 uh, on suffering. So I uh, appreciate Pastor Colby's vote of encouragement for me there. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to try to do both those things. The way I'm going to try to do both those things is to talk about them separately. So... Um, when, uh, when I got married to Jennifer, we, uh, we were going on a honeymoon, and we didn't have any money, and so we took um, donations from people that we knew uh, to go to places, not monetary donations, but donations of houses. So I had an uncle who had a house on a lake in Alabama, and so we went there, and it was on Lake Logan Martin. Some of you may be familiar with that lake. It's a really big lake, a beautiful lake, and I remember seeing the lake for the first time and saying to my uncle, that lake is amazing. It's beautiful. And he said, yeah, and that's just the top. And, I, you know, he kind of caught me off guard a little bit. I thought about it some. And, you know, that was a really profound thing to say. I, it was. It was just the top I was seeing. There's a whole, like, ecosystem and world underneath the surface of that lake that's more mesmerizing than what I saw on the surface. And if you were to look at my family, you, you, the same thing could be true. On the top, it's sort of two-dimensional. It might look great. But underneath, the greatness of our family is attributed to my wife and all that she does and the amazing mother that she is. And that's true in most of your families as well. Um, so uh, moms and specifically Jennifer, um, the role you play in making our uh, lives and families work is, is difficult to describe or imagine or see on the surface. Um, also, I think about my own mom. I lost my mom a few years ago, and she's a, a really, really sweet lady and the, the incredible role she played in my life. And for those of you who are going through Mother's Day without your mothers or maybe your relationship with your mother lacks in some way, I just I, I want to encourage you in this day too. But let's turn our attention to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> We're going to talk about what the true Christian hope is in the midst of suffering. What is the true Christian hope in the midst of suffering? So I'm going to read for you Romans 8, starting in verse 18, where Pastor Colby left off a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to start in verse 18 and go down through 25. <clears throat> Remember, as we every time we turn to, to God's word, this is God speaking to us. The scripture tells us these words are breathed out by God for our reproof and edification and for our training in righteousness. So the things that are being said here to us aren't the opinions of men like we hear all day long, every day on social media and TV and from our friends and neighbors and family members. These are God's words to us. So we should receive them, hear them way differently than everything else we hear. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself would be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Romans 8, 18 through 25, and that's the English Standard Version. I've observed over the years uh, in our church in particular, but in, in my life in general as well, I'm sure you've seen this sort of pattern as well, uh, that people uh, react to suffering in dramatically different ways. Different people react to suffering in dramatically different ways. Even within the church, even mature Christians react to suffering in dramatically different ways. A few years ago, I had two friends in my life. Both friends were going through cancer, severe, serious cancer. They were diagnosed about the same time, and uh, they were going through really a very similar trial at the same time. In one of them, it stirred tremendous, deep faith in Christ. They were, every time I was with them, they were deeply satisfied in God. They were, they were, in a sense, anticipating the good things that might come in their life or in their death in the future. Uh, and, and so one of them was just stirred to faith in Christ and increased their, uh, the cancer diagnosis, increased their dependence on him. And in another, it gave him an occasion to question the goodness of God. And, and it sent him into this like spiral that, that started off kind of subtle, masked with spiritual language. But as, as things got worse and worse and worse, the spiral continued down to a spiral of anger and ultimately unbelief. Suffering is normal. It's a normal part of the human experience. It's a, certainly a normal part of the Christian experience. Um, it's to be expected, even, for us. It's not just that um, it could happen to us, it might happen to us, if we're lucky, we'll avoid it. No, that's not the way the Scripture talks about suffering in the life of a Christian. It is promised to us. It's a promised aspect of the human experience. And for the Christian, suffering is to be welcomed as a gift. Wow. I mean, we, we talk about this kind of a lot here. Uh, we're, we're not a church that avoids uh, sort of the hard truth. So this, this theme comes up a lot in the Bible, right? Uh, even in the book of Romans, as we've gone through, chapter 5, we dealt with this exact issue. Uh, uh, the suffering is, is not just something that we're to navigate around, but it's something we're to welcome in because it actually comes, according to God's word, from God, and it's packed with purpose. We're told, like uh, James is a great example of this, uh, uh, James in chapter 1, we're told by James, this is Jesus' half-brother, and he, he tells us to count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds, when we face different forms of difficulty in, in suffering. We're to count it as joy. That means when the suffering thing comes our way, the Christian response is joy. But we know that that's often not the Christian response. It's not the response our heart gives when we face trials of various kinds. Understanding that the testing of our faith, the reason James says we should count it joy is because we understand something that maybe the world doesn't understand. And what we understand is that the testing of our faith produces in us something that's really, really valuable in the Christian life, and that's steadfastness. So we go through difficulties, trials, they're brought about in our lives because God has permitted them, allowed them, made them to take place, dependent on your theology there. Uh, God brings those or allows those things to come in, into our life, and, and it produces in us, he lets them into our life because it produces in us some form of steadfastness. Now you can imagine this, if you're a parent, there are things you allow into your lives, uh, to the lives of your children that are less than pleasant. Uh, sometimes those might be punishment, sometimes they might be hard work. goes on to say, just as James does, and endurance produces character. Character. So the development of our character, the character in our lives, 
is connected to the, the sufferings that we endure that are permitted or given to us by a God who loves us and is a father to us. In character, he goes one step further than James. He says in character actually produces hope. This is really powerful. We can, we can find hope in this life We can anticipate good things into our future, which opens up the opportunity for us to be joyful because of the suffering that we've been, has been permitted into our life, the steadfastness, the endurance is produced, and the character it develops. And the hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us in abundance that will produce this joy and hope in our lives. So ultimately, the big idea that I want you to walk away with today as we think about suffering is that the suffering that has brought about in your life is from God. It's for the production of endurance and steadfastness. It develops your character and makes you joyful and hopeful. That is a great progression. So here's what you're supposed to know about suffering from the Christian perspective. Romans 5, James 1, suffering is inevitable. We're told that right from these passages. Suffering is inevitable. It's going to be a part of all of our lives uh, at various levels. You know, we, ha- we, we watch some people who suffer tremendous difficulty. We look at their lives and we can't imagine going through the things they've gone through, yet they find themselves to be joyful. Uh, like, it, it, it's a, a hard for us to understand. And we, and we go through sometimes things that are, are difficult to us, but other people might look at them and say, ah, oh, that's nothing, I've been through a lot more than that. And, and it crushes, it can crush us, you know. So, so it's, it, it's very subjective at times um, how the, the suffering feels uh, to us as individuals. So suffering is inevitable for us at various levels, no matter how severe it is, it feels severe in the life of the one suffering. Suffering is inevitable, Romans 5, James 1. Also, suffering is purposeful. That's something else I want you to see. We talked about that already, but there's always purpose in our suffering. Suffering isn't wasted. The, the, the problem in many Christians when they face suffering is that they feel like it's arbitrary. It's wasted. It's not useful. Think of how differently we might receive the suffering that comes into our life if we recognized it for what God says it actually is, something that's intended in our life to make us joyful. I mean, if, if we saw suffering coming down the road for us, and we were able to embrace it and receive it as something God was doing in us, we would, we would find ourselves to be much more willing to learn the lessons that they're intended to teach. Suffering is not just inevitable, but it's purposeful. And the other thing I want you to see in, in suffering is that it ends, it always ends for the Christian in hope. Suffering The end of our suffering is joy and hope in God. Produces steadfastness, brings completeness, produces character, brings hope. With that as a sort of preface, let's look at verse 18, the passage we're looking closely at today. Verse 18, For I consider that sufferings, the sufferings of this present time, are not worth comparing to the glory of that's going to be revealed to us. So what, what, what Paul's doing here is he's, he's starting the whole conversation about suffering off with, a, with it being a comparison. He's saying the sufferings that we're going to go through, those are, are, are small in comparison to the great reward that we will receive in God. So that's a, a way of helping us to receive those sufferings and then not land on us quite so heavily. So Paul, one who himself was acquainted with such suffering, uh, with so much suffering, that he, he starts the conversation about suffering by saying essentially that suffering, the suffering we face, though it is difficult, though it's tough, though I don't mean at all to minimize the difficulty you're going through today, uh, though it's difficult and tough, it's in a category that causes it to be really incomparable with the benefits that are produced from the suffering. It's in a category that causes us to see it as not even comparable, not not the same as the benefits that are produced when one receives uh, the the trials and tribulations from God that bring about suffering and and ultimately eternal glory. In other words, what Paul's saying is 
This is a crazy good deal. It's a crazy good comparison here. He said, yes, you're going to go through some things. They're going to be tough and difficult. And, and keep in mind, the person saying this is not a person who's, been, uh, who's not suffered. He's suffered a great deal. We know of many, many trials and sufferings in his life. He suffered a great deal. And he says to us that those sufferings that he's been through are just very small in comparison to the, what he describes as the weight of glory. It's like this is feather light, the difficulties, the trials that we go through, even though they feel oppressive to us, they're feather light in comparison to the gravitas of the glory of God that is given to us through these sufferings and through the sufferings of Jesus Christ himself. So Paul talks about uh, the issue as a really good deal we have here. Paul talks about this issue a bit more explicitly in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Why don't you just pause for just a second, scroll or turn. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, because this is one of those moments where Paul kind of, if you, if you uh, are able to cross-reference and look around, Paul kind of clicks and expands. He just touches on an idea here in Romans, but if you were to click on that and expand it to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, you'd see a bit more about what he means when he says that phrase. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18. So what's, what Paul said here, remember, is that the sufferings don't compare. I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing to the glory that's being revealed to us. Look at verse 17 and 18 now in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, for, and he's talking about the same suffering. He says, for this light momentary Affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So he describes the heavy, oppressive, difficult suffering you're facing right now, I'm facing right now, that we're sure to face further along in our life. The difficulties that are native to humanity and native to Christianity, these difficulties, Paul describes as a fellow sufferer with us as light and momentary. You see how what he has done is he's he's withdrawn himself to the bigger picture. He's backed up from the actual issue at hand, the difficulty and suffering. He's not staring at that. He's backed up from that and he's put that in the context that it deserves to really be in in our lives. He backed up from it, and he said, in comparison to all of the glory we are to receive in Christ Jesus, this thing we're facing is described as light and momentary. Nothing I go through feels light and momentary to me, unless unless I have the wherewithal to back up and see my light and momentary affliction in light of the eternal weight of glory. I mean, if I'm looking at the eternal weight of glory, the affliction looks light and momentary. But when I'm staring at the affliction, it looks, it looks huge. It looks like it's massive. It covers all of my life, so I can't see anything else. For this light and momentary affliction, what is it doing? The light and momentary affliction is doing a work. Remember, Paul's talked about it doing a work. James talked about it doing a work. What's the light momentary affliction doing? It's preparing us for the eternal weight of glory. It's getting us ready to really enjoy God. It's getting us ready to really savor the goodness of God. He's saying against the dark backdrop of suffering, the light of Christ shines really brightly. As we look not to the things that are seen, he continues on in verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. See, I was talking about zooming out. Not just seeing the things that are seen, like right in front of me, my sufferings, my difficulties, my distress, my problems, but zooming out from those and being able to see the things that are not normally seen when we focus so much on the difficulties and sufferings. For the things that are seen... uh, are uh, a transient but the things that are unseen are eternal this is a great idea i mean the things that are seen they just kind of pass by us but the things that are unseen those are the rocks those are the eternal truths that will never change 
about our God. So this click and expand from Romans 8 to 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 4, 17 and 18 is a really important one for us to understand because really what he's doing here is he's, he's, he's digging down deep into why the sufferings of this life, the difficulties of your day, are, are ultimately not ultimate. So the trick in facing trials is not to face those trials. Like say that again, the, the trick in facing trials is not to face the trials. The trick in facing trials is to face glory. Let me ask for a little help this morning. I need three volunteers. Alex Chapman's got to be one of them. <laughs> Two more. Come on, come on. All right, Amanda, come on up. One more, one more, one more. Okay, Terrence, of course. All right, here we go. You would expect these three. Oh man, I love these three. <laughs> okay, so the idea here is, is, is pretty simple, okay? So, um, Terrence is going to be the eternal way to glory, okay? Glory. Way to glory. Oh, wait, eternal. <laughs> no, you can't trade. <laughs> Amanda's going to be the light and momentary afflictions, the sufferings, okay? <laughs> you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Okay, and Alex is, he's just going along in this life, right? He's going along in this life, and he's just focused on the thing that's happening, and all of a sudden... He gets smacked by a, a, a suffering. <laughs> now, what he does in this instance is really important for his overall perspective, isn't it? If Alex does what most people would do, he's going to turn head on here, and they're going to start waging war. <laughs> uh, we, could, we could just do this all day long, couldn't we? <laughs> but... But if Alex does the other thing and he turns away from the suffering toward the eternal way to glory and he embraces the eternal way of glory, <laughs> he's, he's not going to deal with the sufferings of this life, the light and momentary afflictions. Thank you guys. You crushed it, of course. Uh, that went way better than I expected. <laughs> Usually those things go off the rails. They're, they're hit and miss, but boy, that one was good. Uh, you get the point, though, that as we turn our attention away from those things that are light and momentary afflictions, according to Paul, as we turn our attention away from those things, they really can't capture our attention and our imagination. It's only when we stare at them and we engage with them that they capture so much of our lives. And let me tell you this. If you are, pre if you are spending any moment on, on the Internet... Everyone on the internet right now in an ultra-sensitized way is staring with all of their intensity at all of the difficulties. No one on the internet is talking about the eternal way to glory. So when you engage in, 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 in social media, when you turn it on, you are saying, oh, I want to just swim around inside the sufferings of this life. I just want to live there and and be entertained by it, and I want to see post after post after post after post after post after post until I just conk out in bed of the light and momentary afflictions. I mean, it, we, I don't even think we like, realize what we're doing, and I'm not throwing a grenade at you as somebody who does this unlike me, who's holy, who's always reading my Bible. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm a person scrolling the same thing. I find the same addiction in, in my heart. I have an, a fascination with the difficulties of this life. I want to see those. I'm amused by the difficulties of others. But my attention should be toward, toward full on the weight of well, the glory of God. In so many ways, our posture towards suffering, our theology of suffering, will determine our experience in suffering. You see, you wake up every morning with the opportunity to look square in the face of your suffering Examine it from head to toe, wallow around in the pain of it, consider it again and again, or you have the opportunity, like Paul has said here to us, like his encouragement to us, to turn your face toward the eternal weight of glory. Look at Terrence, y'all. You know, turn your weight toward the eternal weight of glory. Look at the character it produces in you. Look at the purposes of God behind it that fuel it, that motivate it. It promises to allow, uh, and when we promise to do, when we do that, it, it promises to produce in us hopefulness and anticipation 
for God. Look at verse 19. Go to the next verse. For the creation of the world, or I'm sorry, for the creation waits with eager longing. That's what the creation does. We're the creation, right? We and all the rest of the world that have our created, uh, uh, created beings, created objects, all the creation with eager longing looks. The creation waits with eager longing. What are they waiting for? The revealing of the sons of God. Now, that's a confusing phrase. I don't want you to get hung up on it. Two things I want you to understand about this. The phrase, the sons of God, is used elsewhere in the Bible. You see it in various places. It means various things. Often, it means angels. Okay, so if you were to see like in Job, uh, there's also uh, Genesis 6 talks about uh, fallen angels and refers to them as the sons of God. So don't get confused. That's not what he's talking about here, okay? That what, what he's talking about here is a lot more on the nose. The sons of God is us. We're the sons of God, okay? So the, we're, the, we're the children of God. So it's not, it's, not, um, it's not used to be like an image or an allegory. It's just very simple. It's the sons of God. The phrase at the end of the verse, sons of God, is used elsewhere in the Bible. But, uh, but for us here, the meaning is less complex. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not meant to confuse you or to, to mix you up. Paul's talking about our sonship. He's, he's, Paul's talking about us, our restored, specifically, our restored bodies, our restored physical, mental, and spiritual perfection that will come later. So, at the end of that verse, in your mind, sub the phrase sons of God, which could be a confusing phrase, with the revealing of our perfect eternal self. Okay? So, if the verse says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of our perfect eternal selves, that makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? So, I want you to see it and think of it like that. The revealing, the uncovering, the unveiling of our perfect eternal self. Now, we are very aware of our imperfect temporal selves, right? Are we not? Um, I mean, we could talk about this on every level, but it manifests itself mostly in our bodies, in our physical bodies. Um, we find ourselves wasting, you know, we find ourselves aging and, and, and sort of falling apart. It's amu- I don't know about you, if you're an adult, it's amusing to watch my kids who like sort of have in their minds, like I did when I was that age, that their bodies are going to continue to get better and better and better until perfection. They don't know that it's a hill that has a crest. They're, they're just not aware. So because the, everything they know about this life is that the body gets better and better and better and better and better, but they're about to crest the hill and I can't wait. It's going to be really <laughs> exciting. For that to happen, they think their metabolism is going to continue to get better. They think they can eat whatever they want, not exercise, not do anything. They just think they can keep going, but I know it's coming. I know the crest of that hill is coming. So, uh, so but the, our bodies are a way in which we can, like, ta- in a tactile way, we can experience this, this truth that's going on here. At the end of the verse, sub in your mind, sons of God, with the, the revealing of our perfect eternal selves. And as our bodies waste, away and we become older and older and older and we become more frail and more frail and more frail it should produce this desire for the weight of glory in our lives that will deliver a perfect eternal body um paul again he talks about this in in first corinthians paul describes our new resurrected bodies as here's the language he uses for the perishable body will put on imperishable he, he says, the uh, mortal body will put on immortality. So the thing that's wasting away will stop wasting away, and the thing that's dying will stop dying. Wow. That's how Paul is looking at the, the body that's coming. So in the phrase, when you see, for the creation eagerly longs, they wait for that immortal to become, or the mortal to become immortal, the, the, the body to become sustainable and then the second thing i want you to see about these verses verse 19 there uh for the creation eagerly longs for the revealing of the sons of god the revealing of our bodies our new bodies in god the second thing that's noteworthy is that the creation us and the rest of the world are to have our faces turned heavenward we're supposed to eagerly long for eternity this is what the passage tells us like, as the creation who's, who's living under the weight of, of our light momentary afflictions, we're, we're, we're suffering in this life, the suffering is intended to actually produce for us a longing 
for immortality. It's, pr- it's, it's to produce a longing for life with God after this life. Yet, if we, if we, using our illustration again, if we turn our face toward the difficulty and we focus only on that, and we don't think about the immortality offered to God's children from God, we will not be very heavenly minded. Heavenly mindedness doesn't come up when everything's safe and happy. If you find yourself struggling to imagine or think about heaven very much, well, it's probably because you haven't suffered quite enough. It comes up precisely when God's people suffer the deepest pangs of hurt. When we suffer, we begin to long for heaven. Now, I, I have not suffered much in my life. I mean, I've had, um, I've, I've had a, a relatively charmed life physically, physically. Um, I've not been very sick. I've not had difficulties. I have a wonderful wife uh, and wonderful children. I've not gone through a great deal of suffering in any, in any stretch, by any stretch of the imagination. I've had light and momentary sufferings at times. I've gone through difficulties, but I, I've not suffered a, a great deal. But uh, when I do suffer, when I go through something difficult, it, it wrecks me. Um, some of you know that I have had kidney stones uh, a lot in my life. I, I, I mean, people ask me how many times have you had it over 15, uh, 17 year period of time, basically since the church has existed. I don't think there's a connection. Maybe there is. I don't know. Uh, um, I have I have pretty regularly had had kidney stones. Like you know, many currently right now, according to a CAT scan, I have a few kind of hanging out in there, just waiting to hit me later. Uh, and uh, and uh, kidney stones. Uh, they're no joke uh, if you've not experienced it yet. I'm sure there's more suffering in this life, but not that I've experienced. Um, and when I suffer with a kidney stone, when I, I'm, I'm completely knocked out, I, I, there's a, I mean, Jennifer could give you a testimony. Uh, I pace, I jump, I do anything. Like, I, it's so silly. I mean, to think about the sorts of things I do to try to relieve pain, none of it works. Um, I, I just move around a lot. It happens like back here in my back, and it's just debilitating, and I, I groan. I groan like a like a you know dying dog. I mean, I just groan, oh, you know. And Jennifer, I mean, Jennifer puts up with it, and like she she never sends me to the couch or anything like that. I mean, she's really really kind. I told you she's wonderful. Uh, so she she goes through all that with me. That's the, the most suffering I've ever had. And I, I'm here's an amazing thing. I can be today great. I love this life. Never never once thought about you know wishing for the end of it in any way, shape, or form, and I can, I can be half a day, like 12 hours, under the oppression of kidney stones, and literally, if there were a button, like an end your life now button that I could press, I, I would press it. I mean, oh, it's just all over, like just stop it right now, it goes away, I go to heaven, it's all over. Like when I'm in real suffering, like um, I, I, I'm done, I'm okay. I mean, it can take as short as 12 hours. I'm not joking. You think I'm joking. I'm not joking. I, I like can go from happy and wonderful to suicidal in, in 12 hours under <laughs> the kidney stone pain. It's, it's that intense for me. And that might just show how weak I am, but I'm just here to tell you that's, that's how I respond. My, my, the demeanor of my heart changes. I think, too, about Negro spirituals. I mean, I think about the important example that these songs teach us about the type of of impulse that um, instills the spiritual fortitude in those who are suffering. You you know what Negro Spirituals are about? Virtually every every one of them. I mean, if you go read the lyrics of Negro Spirituals, uh, those men and women who were under the oppressive hand of uh, of their slave owners that were suffering day in and day out under physical and emotional uh, distress, their response was song exclusively about heaven. Uh, of the, if you were to take the, if Matt, Matt were to take the songs that we sing and like put them all on a spreadsheet and, and categorize them by topic and, and, and sort it out of a hundred, there might be one or two about heaven. If you were to do that with Negro spirituals, there'd be 99 about heaven. Is that a coincidence? No. Because what suffering is intended to produce in us is a longing for God. It's supposed to produce in us a longing for God, for a life without suffering, a life with God. Heaven 
wasn't a, a privilege possessed by the master class, but it was a promise sustaining those suffering under the weight of slavery, terrorized on this earth. The heavenly mindedness of the Negro slaves as documented in their songs was also a mark of that day's preaching. It wasn't just the songs, the preaching of that day by, by, slave, by, by enslaved pastors was preaching largely about heaven. What we might look at and call a fascination with heaven seemed like all they talked about. Is that their only category of theology? Seemed like all they talked about, a fascination with heaven, it bled into even the American Civil Rights Movement. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming for to carry me home, a band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. If you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home. Tell my friends I'm coming too, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. You see, they were longing for God. Begs the question, and our generation do, doesn't sing about heaven if our generation doesn't sing about heaven if our sermons are about heaven why is it why is it that we are not so fascinated in corruption but the true freedom that comes from the glory that is waiting awaiting the children of god wow that is amazing creation is going to be set free from this curse a resurrected future in creation means set free from the bondage of decay and death. We can't even we can't even begin to fathom what it will be like to live in a world where there is not constant decay, sin and death. But let your mind go there. Let your mind go like how how much of your mind's attention is set on protecting yourselves from the reality of the decay of our lives and our bodies, the influence and effect of sin in our lives, and the looming reality of the death of everyone we love and even ourselves. That is a heavy curse to live under, and the only reason we don't buckle under its pressure is because it's not new to us, and we've known it since we were born. We've lived inside the reality of this awful curse for so long that we don't even let our minds imagine what a curseless life, a curseless existence with God will look like. But when we suffer, when we suffer, our minds start to go there. It's one of the graces of God in suffering. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning. Go back to my groaning, the pains. The gro uh, like the whole creation is groaning together in the pain inwardly, but we don't groan outwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions for the redemption of our very own bodies, for our own bodies to be redeemed and renewed. And look how it ends in verse 24. This is so encouraging. It says, For this hope we are, uh, <laughs> for in this hope we were saved. What, what is he talking about? What's the hope in which we were saved? The hope of eternity with God. The hope of life without suffering. The hope for joy in eternity. We live under that oppressive weight. We're never going to get away from it. We're hemmed into it. In the midst of it, we can live a full and rich and abundant life by turning to look and anticipate the eternal weight of glory and not staring at our light and momentary afflictions. But it produces, as we look for the eternal weight of glory, it produces a hope in us that causes us to long for something better down the road and keeps us motivated in this life and puts our light and momentary afflictions in perspective. Now, hope that is seen isn't hope. Saying if we saw it, if we, if we were able to turn on a channel on our TV and kind of see what we're looking for, like a commercial for Sandals Resort or something like, like that, if we were able to turn it on and look at it, it wouldn't be the same. But it's because our minds can imagine it, the promises that have been given them to us in God, it, it's for us to put our faith in God, for us to trust in God, is for us to take Him at His word and say, even though I don't know that thing, I haven't experienced it, I haven't tasted it, I haven't seen it, I know it's true because I love you and I trust you, God. I, I love the, the uh, illustration I've heard many times, you've probably heard it too, but Mrs. Albert Einstein one time asked, Ma'am, do you understand the theory of relativity? And she said, no, but I know Albert, and you can trust him. 
I love that. I love that. No, I don't, I don't understand all the mysteries of God, but I know God and I know I can trust Him. I know I can trust Him. I know that the, the hope in this life is hinged upon the reality, uh, the coming about of His promises. For who hopes for what he sees? Well, we do. We are the answer to that question. We hope for what, uh, or who hopes for what he sees, uh, but if we hope for what we do not see, I'm sorry, we, we hope for what we do not see, not for what we see. That, that, that is faith, and we wait for it. We wait for the thing that God has promised to us with patience. God has given us tremendous hope in this. So here's a couple quick applications for you. If you're a person who tends to turn toward your suffering, not away from your suffering when something happens. If you're a person that can't get your mind off of the difficulties and the stresses in your life, you can't even begin to fathom what it would look like to look toward the eternal weight of glory instead of staring down the barrel of your difficulties and distress. If you're that person, here's a few applications for you. Number one, remember, specifically, these 24 words. Seriously, memorize this verse. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What if that came to your mind every time you were tempted to face a, a struggle or difficulty in your life? What if, if your mind could, without even thinking, as a reaction, it could remember the words, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. So a very practical way in which you can respond to a sermon like this, if you're a person who turns your attention all the time to the sufferings of this life, is to memorize those 24 words in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Number two, the second thing that I think you can do, a very practical thing you can do if you're a person who tends to turn toward suffering, not away from suffering, is, is, uh, w- is to help one another not to say crazy things and think crazy things that are going on through your mind when you suffer. Do you know when you suffer, if you stare at the suffering, you start to lie to yourself and the enemy lies to you and you let him. You think crazy, crazy things. One of my favorite 21st century philosophers named Alec Chapman told me one time, he told me one time, if the only person you have to talk to is yourself, you make crazy decisions. It's totally true. It's totally true. It was in the context of him talking about his grandmother who had a car. What kind of car was it? A Bonneville, uh, which uh, she sold for a small amount of money, $500. And he said, Grandma, why'd you do that? And she said, well, when you only have yourself to talk to, you don't make very good decisions. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's totally true. When we talk to ourselves only, we don't make very good decisions. And so one of the wonderful things we do for one another as the body, as the family of faith, is we help talk each other out of the lies of this life. We, we hear and see and sense the, the droop of someone's countenance when they're facing a difficulty and we speak truth and life into their situation where it might seem awkward and a little uh, inappropriate for us to go into that space. One of the ways we serve one another is by pointing one another to the eternal way to glory. We say to one another, oh, I know you're going through this thing right now. I, I've been there too, but I found hope in turning my face toward the eternal way of glory in taking my eyes off the sufferings of this life. So we can remind one another. We have the responsibility to help one another not say and think lies that are put in our heads by the enemy. So we can remember, we can memorize the scripture, we can remind one another, and next, this is a real practical one, we can just remove anxiety-producing influences in our lives that drive us to despair remove anxiety producing influences in our life that drive us to despair for some of us that means something as simple as limiting our social media interaction or shutting it down altogether for some of us it might mean a change of job it might just mean like hey this job's good it pays a lot of money but i i get drug into the pits of worldliness and despair every single day 
because of the people I have to interact with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God by removing myself from that situation. I'm not going to be there anymore. Some of it's your family, your company, your extended family, people in your life that are anxiety-producing anxiety influences in your life. And you know what that is in a way that I don't. I can't uh, stand up here and say it's, it's this person in your life or that person or this, this channel that you need to block or not think about. I can't say what it is. But he was pierced through. Why? For our transgressions. So the weight of our sufferings, the, the, the difficulties and distresses that we face, he bore the weight of them for us. The chastisement of our peace was upon him by his stripes. We were healed. Jesus the one that we are to turn to, to look toward, to trust in for the eternal weight of glory, as himself felt not just the, an equal difficulty of despair as we have, but he has actually borne our despair. It's incredible. We have a beautiful Savior who is offered to himself. And as we come together to take the Lord's Supper today, we're going to pass around the elements. What we do when we receive the, the drink and, and the, the bread is we say again, God, we believe that and we accept it into our own lives. We consume it. We make it part of us. And so let me encourage you, if you are a, a believer, a follower of Christ here, and particularly if you're a person who wants to turn away from a, 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 a fascination, a full-on view of the sufferings of this life toward the eternal weight of glory, to participate with us today in this, in this sacred meal. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. And it's your word that picks our head up out of the fascination we have with the sufferings of this world and this life. Lord, our minds are constantly drawn to it. We want to wallow in our own sufferings. We want to experience and witness and see the sufferings of others. And Lord Jesus, we want you to give us this, uh, uh, an equal yet more intense fascination with the eternal weight of glory. God, in, by whatever means you see fit, bring about to us a desire, a longing for our pending adoption into your home. And give us a joy-producing, um, heaven-facing posture that would cause us to seek you and love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength right here in this life. And to consider the difficulties in our life as nothing more than light and temporary affliction.